You're listening to episode 678 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. In this week's episode, I make a small error in the reporting of the population of the town of Nazareth 2,000 years ago in Jesus' time. And I mentioned that it was 480 families in my homily, when actually it was no more than 480 people, according to recent uh, estimates from the archaeological digs and reported in the Anchor, Anchor Bible Dictionary in 1992. So I just want to make that really clear so that as you hear that, you can kind of correct it in your head. And in the meantime, this is the homily entitled Making Families Holy, and given on the Feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, 2018. On the day after Christmas, I had the privilege of hosting my 93-year-old mother and one of my sisters, Carolyn. I have six sisters. If you didn't know, I'm the ninth of nine children, so we know family. But I was able to then to convince my mom, because she normally uh, walks with a, a walker, and she gets exhausted just going across the room. So I was able to convince her, along with my sister Carolyn, for her to be in a wheelchair. Doing that, then we were able to bring her into the church here, and she got to go all over the church. She was one of the main reasons to come down from the Salem area, besides myself, was to see our beautiful church. She'd been following our progress on Facebook. That's right, a 93-year-old Facebooker. And she had a little insight from the guy that was helping it out at the top there as well. And we were able to then show her all around. We ran around the pews, we went into the daily chapel, we went in everywhere. Sacristy, how do we get into sacristy? We got a ramp, had her come up on the, uh, the, predora, the, the predella here, and then we were able to see what it's like shared with her the altar, all the things that are particular to the altar. And then from there, we went to uh, Medford to see all our old haunts where we grew up, on Oakdale Street, Sacred Heart Church, all kinds of wonderful things there. And then we went to the Basilica of St. Costco. <laughs> Between the three of us, I've never had that many things in my shopping cart because we needed some food, and food we got. (laughs) From there, we went to a Chinese restaurant that we both, we all loved, and so we went there and met up with some parishioners. So for me, Christmas was a very wonderful time of family, a time that I don't normally get. As a priest, we're kind of locked down at Christmas for the most part, and it's hard to get away. And I'm not, you know, asking you for your forgiveness, or I'm not saying I'm sorry about this. This is one of the things. You are family. I have a title called Father for that very reason, as a spiritual father to help shepherd the family. So I have a lot of good things, a lot of wonderful things to be thankful for. I'm thankful for many of your kind gifts, and I had a stack of cards that it took me a couple days to get to, and I went through them all, and I was just wondering, it's just amazing, it's a wonder, very thankful. I prayed over each person that had a card that I received, whatever gift that might be affiliated with it. And I, most of all, just want to thank you for not giving me a fruitcake. That, I want to make sure <laughs> we're really clear on that. It's one of those strange kind of, it looks like it's candy, but it's kind of like bread. And when you bite into it, you hit a nut, and then you're like, ah! It's very confusing, very confusing. Well, I want to unconfuse some of the things we heard at the scriptures today, the liturgy of the word. We heard a couple of terms in the scriptures. One was a Nazarite. And the other one was a Nazarene. They sound like the same thing, but they actually are are completely different from each other. They just sound similar. They don't have anything to do with each other. So a Nazarite, again, is not the same as a Nazarene, but a Nazarite comes from the Hebrew Nazir, which means to consecrate or to be separate. A Nazarite is a person who makes a vow, either temporarily or perpetually, permanently, to God. Commonly, they would refrain from cutting their hair. I'm starting to wonder if Father R.G. is a Nazarite. (laughs) 
or drinking wine or anything made from grapes and avoiding other things that would make them uh, ritually impure, like uh, coming in contact with a corpse or a grave, things like that. And so when they're perpetual, as we heard in the scripture, that person is dedicated through that vow for the rest of their life. If they're temporary, then it comes to an end and there's some other things that are done at the conclusion, kind of as a sign of thanksgiving. Now, a Nazarite, then, is different than a Nazarean. A Nazarean is somebody simply from Nazareth. That's right. Jesus the Nazarean. Jesus was not a Nazarite. He was a Nazarean. The word Nazareth comes from the Hebrew netzer, N-E-T-S-E-R. That's the, the equivalent as we try to pronounce it, which means branch. So a Nazareth is a branch. And it's interesting because this is Jesus' childhood home, right? Nazareth. And archaeological evidence has recently demonstrated that there was probably about only 480 families in Nazareth. It wasn't real big. Or excuse me, yeah, 480 in Nazareth in his day. It is fascinating to know that the Nazareth, being the word meaning branch, also can be connected with Isaiah 11.1 1, where we hear this. From the root of Jesse, a branch, a netzer, will bear fruit. Think of that. So that if you know some of uh, the scriptures, the Hebrew and Greek, you can come from that. You get from the Hebrew, that netzer, that from this netzer, from Nazareth, will come fruit. What is the fruit? It's Jesus. So you can see the play on words being offered here. From the root of Jesse, so you have a plant, and then from this comes Jesus. The Greek word is Nazara, and there's other derivations that come from Aramaic, but Nazara in Greek is what we see if you were to dig down into the Gospels and find the, the word they're using there. Now, this is all great, and by the way, you can throw this out. I like to think of these cool, geeky terms in a, one of your Christmas parties you might yet not had. And just throw that out there, like, I know what a Nazarite is. Want to know? <laughs> Well, today, as we continue the octave, the completing octave of Christmas, today we celebrate the Holy Family. And so the church be puts before us stories of families. First, of Hannah and Samuel. The second, God our Father and us, his children. The third, Joseph and Mary losing and then finding their child Jesus in the temple. The first two are rather romantic and mystical. And we can reflect on those and imagine, wow, you know, she was, Hannah was seeking out a child. She went to the temple, talked to the priest, and said, I would make a promise, and I would bring this child and bring him back for you, to God. The, the second one is a, quite a theological treatise on how our identity is most fundamentally being a child of God. So often people say, well, who are you? You know, actually the most definitive and accurate answer is, I'm a child of God. The third story, which is in the gospel of Jesus and Mary and Joseph, is troubling. So it's not romantic, it's actually troubling. Think about this. If you were a, a parent and you lost your child in the store, don't you get panicked? Yeah, I remember being a little kid, getting lost in the store and it gets, becomes worrisome my mother when she would go to the basilica of saint costco she would be in her walker and i could leave her for five minutes and come back and she's only moved like 10 yards that's about it but now in her wheelchair with my pushing her i lost my own mother about three or four times and she was nowhere near where i last saw her and I was doing that common thing that we probably all do. You walk very quickly down an aisle. You look, stop, walk next aisle, look, stop, and keep going until you find her. And then you got this look of, oh, whew. And I'm thinking, I must look like a fool doing this. <laughs> but I know that I'm not alone. But this story, think about this. Not only did Jesus stay put, they only realized a day later, now keep in mind, they're, work, they're, they're journeying in a caravan, so they assume that he is with the caravan. But then they go back and they need three days to find him. By the way, do you see a connection with three days here? 
Three days he was gone, you could say, after his crucifixion. And he came back after the third day. So you can see how these all play together. So on the third day, the parents find Jesus. And Mary, being the Jewish woman that she is, she goes, don't you know how much you put us through? What a guilt trip, right? And of course, Jesus is like, hey, mom, didn't you know where I would be? This shows a development in their relationship, assumptions on both parts, not fully communicating, but then becomes very clear. From then on, we hear that Jesus grew in obedience and wisdom to mom and dad. Hear that, kids? <laughs> Jesus did that. And so we see some confusion in the early part of their becoming family, and it gets clarified through time. So we are here to reflect on the Holy Family. We've been given these examples. What was it like at Christmas for your family? Maybe it was a time of delight. Maybe you saw me walking through Costco and trying to hunt down my mother. I don't know. You thought it was pretty funny looking. Or maybe it was stressful. First, you know, maybe there was that one person that has always been there and was not. For whatever reason, through death or divorce or, in the case, possibly work. A lot of people have to work during those times. You may have seen the news article about a dad who was separated from his daughter and he wanted to be with her. Well, she was a flight attendant. Does this sound familiar? Some of you may have seen this. Well, he decided he wanted to be with her, so his wife stayed home, and he booked a flight where she was working <laughs> on Christmas. But not just one flight, six flights to cover the whole day. <laughs> Pretty impressive. So one commentator wrote this, that when it comes to love, the sky is the limit for this guy. <laughs> Anywho, the, the important feast of this church day that we have is meant to remind us of the humanity and the divinity present in the families, and particularly the holy family, and that we too as Christians have the potential to be in the same mix, a mix of humanity and divinity. Well, the humanity is obvious. We keep bumping into it, right? But what about this divinity part? Well, I'd like to offer a very simple solution, and few do it. We need, we need to simply invite Jesus into our family. We just invite him. Come, Lord Jesus, into our family. Be the guide of our family. Do you invite Jesus into your family? Do you each day consecrate your family to the Lord? I know families that when their children leave, they make sure before they leave, they offer them a blessing. They bless them on their head or they invoke a blessing on their family or their family members as they leave. Do you let Jesus help you make family decisions? Do you listen to him when you read the scriptures and try to listen so that you will know what you need to do? When you worry, who do you go to? Is it the Lord? Have you gone out of your way, keeping your eye on him, and thus having to return back to him when you get lost? We do that all the time. We do it on our own. I know Jesus got my back, but just stay back there. I'll get to you when I need you. The nice thing about all this is that, while we may sometimes dismiss, dismiss Jesus from things, he doesn't dismiss us. He was always faithful, even when we're not. And so our life is like a pilgrimage, and he wants to be on that journey with us, guiding us as our pilgrim leader. Do you let him guide you in all aspects? Or are there some where, nah, I'm going to say, just blink, Jesus, I'm going to take care of myself in this regard. Well, regardless of the ups and downs of our families, we do have a holy family whom we can see as a model and with whom we can commune in prayer. Remember that all three, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, are in heaven and know what is going on with us. So for homework, that's right, homework. I know it's Christmas break, I know. Make an extra effort to show holy love to a family member. 
especially where there may be frayed nerves or even brewing anger or a disagreement. You don't need to be a Nazarite, nor do you have to go to Bethlehem or be from Bethlehem to take care of this. But you can make a covenant with God for the good of your own family. Remember, you are from the family that God has given you. Remember, you are a chosen one of his. You are part of his family. And as we say, if we were doing this in Latin at the end of Mass, go, the Mass is ended. I want to encourage us to go and love our families. Love them and let them know that they are God's beloved children. For indeed, we all are. Let them know of your love. And let his love remain in us. Let us commit ourselves to be loving members and help transform our families into holy families. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Father Bills Podcast. As I produce this episode, it is now December 31st, 2018, which means we're on the cusp of the new year. And what better way to celebrate the new year than to offer Mass? And in the church, we celebrate this as Mary, Mother of God. That's the name of the Mass. That's the solemnity that we celebrate. And at first glance, you would say, it's all about Mary. But actually, it's about Mary, but it's actually more about Jesus. And how's that? Well, in the early church, in the 400s, a patriarch of Constantinople named Nestorius proposed uh, an idea about how Jesus was human and divine. There was discussion about this going on, and he would like to propose that the two natures of Jesus, human and divine, were separate, not in any kind of direct union like the rest of the church was speaking about, which is what's called a hypostatic union, a mystical union that comes together and, you could say, while being distinct, also is uh, melded together in some mystical way. I won't get into the more details on that. But this was then a topic of discussion at the Council of Ephesus because in 431, when this, this uh, gathering of the bishops occurred, they were trying to uh, look at the Nicene Creed that we had already had uh, proposed and take a look at this Nestorianism that was developing. They ultimately condemned it to say that, well, and Nestorius was saying that, well, Mary can be the... Uh, the Christ bearer, but not the God bearer, the Christotokos, but not the Theotokos. The church, though, affirmed that Mary is the Theotokos, or the, the giver, giver, the birth giver of God, or the God bearer. Whoever is in her womb is God. Jesus is God, human and divine. And so that's what we're celebrating. We're actually celebrating the divinity of Christ. And so I want to encourage you on the first uh, day of the new year to consider going to Mass. Uh, it is a holy day of obligation, but knowing this history is in a very important, it's like the earliest title of Mary affirming uh, the nature of Jesus, his divine and human natures in one person. If you have any questions, as always, just go to my website, fatherbill.org, uh, F-R-B-I-L-L dot org, and there you can connect with me on my social media platforms or just email me directly from the webpage. And I will do my best to get back to you. Until next time, may God bless you and have a great new year. Bye-bye.